Good evening and welcome to the midweek meeting for prayer and Bible study here in Stranmullis EPC. It's Wednesday the 7th of July and as we gather together tonight we'll be following what has become our normal format. Uh, last week we departed from it by holding a united prayer meeting together in the church but tonight we'll have our study on YouTube and Facebook and then at 8.30 we'll divide into our Zoom prayer meetings. Can I just mention that if you are interested in helping out with the Holiday Bible Club in the summer uh, there is a Zoom meeting at 9.30 tonight for anybody who's interested in helping out in any way, uh, not just in terms of maybe being involved in the meeting itself, in terms of teaching a, a memory verse or something of that nature, uh, but it looks likely that we will need folk to drive minibuses, we'll need folk to assist in other ways. So if you're interested in any way at all in being involved in the Holiday Bible Club, uh, please do log on at 9.30. The Zoom details are available in Sunday's bulletin and also went out on the WhatsApp group earlier uh, today. Let us now come before God. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we come to you this evening in Jesus' name. We come to you, O God, having in many ways become accustomed to this way of connecting with each other. But we pray, O Lord our God, that over these incoming months you would be pleased to undertake for us and for the society in which we live. We recognize that you are the God who is in control of everything. And so we pray that as we come towards the autumn months, that we may be able to resume greater normality in the life of the church. We pray that we may be able to get back to those activities and to those meetings which once we held within the church building. Oh Lord our God, we seek you for wisdom, for discernment, that we might make wise decisions and that you would guide us in them. We thank you for your word and we thank you that it is food for our souls. And we pray this evening that as we come now to consider your word, that you would come to us, O Lord, and give us help. We are ever thankful for our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're ever thankful for his life and for his death. And we're thankful this evening that you receive us and accept us when we come to you in Christ. We ask, O oh God, that you would hear our cry and that you would look upon us graciously. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we're going through the first book in the Psalms, that is, the Psalms 1 to 40. We've come tonight to the Psalm 32. Uh, but before we read that Psalm, we're just going to read a few verses in 2 Samuel chapter 12. 2 Samuel chapter 11, and then one or two verses in chapter 12. 2 Samuel 11, at the beginning. I think it will be obvious as our study progresses tonight as to why I'm reading these verses. 2 Samuel 11. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Then she returned to her house, and the woman conceived, 
And she sent and told David, I am pregnant. Then let's go across to the next chapter, to 2 Samuel chapter 12. And here again, we'll read just a few verses at the beginning of this chapter. 2 Samuel 12. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveller to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, You are the man. Now let's go to the psalm, the psalm 32. And we'll read the whole psalm from the beginning. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Amen. Now, this is a very well-known psalm, some of the psalms that we've looked at. We are perhaps not all that familiar uh, with them. Uh, last week, we were thinking about Psalm 31 when we gathered in the church for the prayer meeting. And that, that's a psalm uh, that is full of instruction for us and very worthwhile meditation. But it's not a psalm that we know well in contrast to this Psalm 32 that is before us this evening. There seems to be really no doubt that this is a psalm of David. And as we come to the psalm this evening, I, I very simply want to approach it in three ways. Uh, I want us firstly to think about the context. I then want us to look together at the content. And finally then, to reflect on the comfort of this psalm, the context, the content and the comfort. Now, what is the context here? Well, among Bible scholars and uh, commentators, there is really no dispute that the context, <coughs> the background to this psalm is, is the, the dreadful, the appalling, the shocking sin which David committed with Bathsheba. We read together just a few verses from Second Samuel chapter 11. 
And there in that chapter we, we read of that awful moment in David's life when he fell into gross and dreadful sin, when he committed adultery with Bathsheba, and when he then arranged for her husband Uriah to be put to death. Uh, when the armies had left Jerusalem and had gone to battle and to war, he remained behind and seeing this a beautiful woman, he was overcome with lust and engaged in the sin of adultery. Now, everyone has agreed that what we have here in this Psalm 32 uh, are David's thoughts. David's thoughts, not only in relation to the sin he has committed, but David sharing with us how he has been restored to the Lord, how he has being reinstated into close fellowship with God after having fallen into gross and terrible sin. Now you might say to me, wait a minute, I thought that was Psalm 51. Uh, you're saying this is Psalm 32 and, and it's David's response to the sin in which he's engaged. It's David sharing with us how he's managed to get back to fellowship with the Lord. I thought that's what Psalm 51 was all about. And don't we love this psalm? And don't we often sing it and meditate uh, upon it? What great words there are in this psalm. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Oh, great words. Words which David penned under the direction and guidance of God the Holy Spirit when he had repented of his sin, when he had acknowledged his sin, when he had sought God's forgiveness, and when he was restored to close communion and fellowship with God. But can I suggest to you that Psalm 51, it seems to me, was penned by David more or less immediately he has repented of his sin. We read in 2 Samuel chapter 12, where Nathan the prophet comes to David and very skillfully exposes to him the awfulness and the rottenness of the sin in which he has engaged. Nathan confronts him with his sin. And we have those, those great words, you are the man. You are the man who has sinned against God. You are the man who has failed God dreadfully. You are the man who needs to seek God. And it would seem that having listened to the prophet and listened to God as he is speaking to him through the prophet, David pens the words of Psalm 51. Psalm 32 has been prompted by the same sin and by the same occasion. The context of this psalm is undoubtedly uh, the sin with Bathsheba. But it would seem to me that what we have here is, in a sense, a later reflection on the part of David. A little time has passed between the moment when he has confessed his sin and acknowledged his wrongdoing unto God and the words that are penned here in Psalm 32. I think that one of the reasons I would hold to that view is that the second part of the psalm here, from verse 6 onwards, isn't speaking so much and so directly about David's failure and sin with Bathsheba, but is in fact more reflective, is considering God's dealings with the righteous in a more general sense. You are a hiding place for me. Verse 7, you preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. And then God himself seems to be speaking, as it were, directly. In verse 8, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. The second half of the psalm is, is more reflective. It is David considering, in a more general sense, God's dealings with the righteous in the trials of life, when they fail God's. 
and God himself speaking in the psalm. Now, having seen the context, the backdrop to the psalm, let's secondly consider the content here. And we're focusing especially on the opening verses where David is specifically speaking about that sin that he engaged in. And very interestingly, I want you to notice three strands here in what David has to say. First of all, when he sinned with Bathsheba, he did his utmost to cover it up. He did his utmost to make sure that no one found out about the dreadful sin in which he had been involved. Now, people obviously must have known about it. David lived in a palace. There were courtiers. There were people all around. There were guards and servants and all kinds of people in and around the palace. But certainly David is making a a strident effort to make sure that his wickedness and sinfulness doesn't become widely known. And he's certainly not speaking about it. He hasn't confessed it to God. He doesn't want to to speak of it to God or to anyone else. Verse 3. This is the first strand we notice here. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Quite a vivid picture, isn't it? David is saying here that really he didn't confess his sin unto God initially. He kind of tried to forget it, uh, tried to press it down uh, and to get it out of his memory. Yet it was always in there. And it was beginning to affect him physically. People would would have been saying, he's not at himself, you know. He's not at himself. Did you see David last night? Didn't he look dreadful? Sometimes we say that, don't we? Of of, of someone, you know, I bumped into so-and-so. Oh, they were looking terrible. They were looking terrible. And that's how it was when when David refused to bring his sin out in the open before God and confess it on to God. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. <laughs> Think about the grass. In years gone by, we used to have hosepipe bands. I don't think we have so many hosepipe bands anymore. Uh, but I can certainly remember when I was much younger, there used to be these hosepipe bands. And there were periods of drought when there was no rain. And uh, for whatever reason, we weren't allowed to, you know, attach the hosepipe onto the outside tap and water the grass. So it became all dried up and shriveled and yellow. And David says, that's how it was with me. I was all shriveled up. I wasn't openly acknowledging my sin. I was seeking to cover it up. I wasn't speaking of it to you, Lord. And it it had an impact upon me in my very physical being. I was utterly out of sorts. But then there's the second strand here, which I want you to notice, and it's in verse 5. I acknowledged my sin to you. I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Now, this is a great moment. This is a man of God, a man who has faith, a man who is considered righteous in God's sight, confessing his sin to God and experiencing the forgiveness of God. It's like a great weight being lifted off his shoulders. He's no longer weighed down because he's openly brought it out before God. He's acknowledged it, not in a general sense. Oh Lord, please forgive me for all the wrong things that I have done. No, that's general confession. But there's particular confession going on here. He is brought before God the particular sin of adultery and murder in which he has been involved. And God has forgiven him. It's that great expression, isn't there, in the Westminster Confession of Faith, which talks about confessing particular sins particularly unto God. 
So the first strand is when he's, he's trying to subdue what he's done, the sin. Keep it all under wraps. But he's weighed down by it. But then, under the prompting of Nathan the prophet, he openly acknowledges his sin unto God, confesses his iniquity, and experiences the forgiveness of God. And it's the forgiveness of God and rejoicing in God's forgiveness that is very much on his mind here in the opening verse. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. See the rejoicing. God has heard his cry and he doesn't doubt God's forgiveness. Yes, there's going to be trouble. There's going to be difficulty. There's going to be consequences arising out of this sin. Yeah, there, there, there are going to be things happening in his family, not least the rebellion of Absalom, which are consequences arising out of the sin in which he has engaged the chastisement of God, if you like, and the discipline of God. But he knows that God has forgiven him. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven. So the context is the grievous sin. The content is here before us in three strands. A, a time when it's all under wraps and weighing him down. A moment of great confession unto God when he acknowledges his sin. And a time of rejoicing that whilst life may not ever be quite the same again, he'll walk with a limp spiritually. But God has received him and accepted him and forgiven him and pardoned him for his iniquity. The context, the content, and now the comfort arising out of this psalm. It seems to me that the comfort is twofold. Don't misunderstand me here, but there is a certain comfort in recognizing that some of the greatest saints of God are capable of falling into terrible sin. Here is David, a man after God's own heart, the sweet psalmist of Israel, a great leader among God's people, who's known God's deliverance remarkably, especially when he was being chased about by Saul. Yet even though he has experienced the protection and safekeeping of God, and even though he's known the hand of blessing upon his life, bringing him to the kingship, to the monarchy, Yet even he, so privileged and blessed, makes a mess of it, spiritually. And it helps us in the sense that we can identify with David. He's not out of our reach. He's not untouchable. There's a certain comfort in that. When we come to Scripture, the reality with which the characters of Scripture are set before us, like David and others, we can kind of enter into their experience. They're, they're close to us. We can reach them because we see them with their warts as well as their great characteristics. <clears throat> but the comfort, the particular comfort, and the great comfort is this, that when we mess up as Christians, when we mess up as believers, when we mess up as the children of God, God hears our cry for forgiveness. He forgives our iniquity and he pardons our sin. Isn't that marvelous? Isn't that marvelous? Free forgiveness when we come in brokenness. Unto God. Now, let's, let's, not, let's not be unclear about what's going on here. David is a child of God. He falls into gross sin. The fact that he falls into gross sin doesn't in some way make him no longer a child of God. Sadly, he falls into gross sin as a believer. 
It isn't that when he sins with Bathsheba that he suddenly loses his salvation. I've told you before about a woman I heard about in a prayer meeting who was praying for a particular individual. And she prayed for this, this man. We'll call him George, though that wasn't his real name. She said, Lord, George used to be a Christian and he's not a Christian now. Make him a Christian again. Make him a Christian again. Well, it isn't that David used to be a believer and then he fell into sin with Bathsheba and he lost his salvation. Oh, Lord, please make David a Christian again. No, that's, that's not what's going on here. And David himself is very clear about that in Psalm 51. Restore to me, not my salvation, restore to me the joy of salvation. He hasn't lost his salvation. Oh, he's lost the joy of it, but he hasn't lost salvation. When a child of God, when one who has faith in the Lord... When one who by God's grace has turned from their sin and is looking to God for salvation falls into sin. It doesn't mean that you cease to be a believer. It doesn't mean that you lose your salvation. It means that your fellowship with God and your communion with God and your closeness with God is seriously impacted and impaired and damaged because of your sin. The good weather that we've been having recently reminds me uh, of summers uh, in times past. My father was a keen gardener, a very keen gardener, and he had a greenhouse. And in his greenhouse, he grew tomatoes. He had a lot of tomato plants in his greenhouse. And uh, when he went away on holiday, it was uh, my role to water his tomatoes. And there were a few other things involved as well. You had to water them from memory in the morning and then in the evening. And you had to also open the vents in the greenhouse in the morning and close them again in the evening. But you had to keep an eye on the weather because, you know, if it was particularly sunny, then you opened them wider. And if it wasn't so sunny, you know, you didn't open them so far. And then you had to, and I was never too sure about this, you had to sort of look at the leaves of the tomato plants um, to make sure that some sort of green beasties weren't crawling on the leaves and if they were there was some sort of spray that you had to to put on to make sure they they weren't damaging the tomatoes and when my father returned from his holiday one of the very first things he would ask me one of the very first things he would ask is this how did you get on with the tomatoes how did you get on with the tomatoes and if I just said to him, Dad, you know, I, I was just bored out of my mind by your tomatoes and all this fiddling about with spray and vents and water. I just didn't be bothered. I, you know, I wasn't going to get into, in, into all, that, all that tomato stuff. He'd have been raging. He'd have been angry. And, uh, he, you know, he, he, he would have expressed that fairly, fairly clearly. I, I would still have been his son, of course, and he was my father. Nothing was going to change that. Nothing, nothing, nothing was going to change that. But for a few days, maybe even longer, there would have been a significant atmosphere between us, a distance. And here is David, God is his father, by grace, he's been adopted into the family of God. He's considered righteous in the sight of God, not because he is righteous, but because Jesus is going to come and live and die for his sins. God is his father, and he's his child. Nothing, nothing, can change that. But what we're looking at here in Psalm 32 is what a Christian should do when they sin. Sisters and brothers, if you sin, then you've got to bring your sin to God. Not because you've lost your salvation. Not because your justification has gone pear-shaped. But you should bring your sin unto God. Because your fellowship with God, your communion with Him is marred. Your effectiveness in the work of God is seriously impaired. You need to acknowledge your sin to him. Don't cover up your iniquity. Confess your transgressions and he will forgive your iniquity. He will pardon your transgression 
And you'll be able to rejoice in the wonder and blessing of forgiveness as David does here. Is this for you tonight? Maybe it isn't. But maybe it is. Maybe you've messed up and nobody knows. Nobody knows. But God knows. And you know. You know what you need to do? You need to have an Ethan moment whenever you humbly recognize your sin before God and say, Lord, I am your child, and oh boy, I have let you down. I am your child, but boy, I've failed you. I've made a right mess of it. Oh God, forgive me. Forgive me. And do you know what? Here's the good news. He will. He will. Not begrudgingly, but willingly. Willingly. As the father in the parable of the prodigal son rushed down the road to meet the boy as he was returning, flung his arms around him. So our God delights in the penitence of his children and comes in forgiveness and pardon and love and grace. Why don't you get alone with him tonight? Why don't you bring to him that sin? that your fellowship and communion may once more be close with God, that there may no longer be a distance, an atmosphere between you. Acknowledge your sin. Don't cover your iniquity. Confess your transgressions to the Lord. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the reality of your word. We thank you for this psalm and we thank you for your mercy, your grace, your forgiveness and your love. We bless you that you bear with us your children. Help us, O oh Lord, to keep short accounts with you. Help us to walk in close communion with you. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.